My name is Christine Oswald and I'm the manager of membership and programs at the Fulbright Association. I am very excited to welcome the Foreign Policy Association to today's webinar to discuss their Great Decisions program and how you all as chapter leaders can use their tools to organize forums for world affairs discussions. Um, please keep your microphones muted throughout the presentation and put any questions you have in the Q&A or the chat. Thank you so much for joining. And we are now going to hear from some members of the Foreign Policy Association team who run the Great Decisions program. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Karen Rowan. I'm the editor of Great Decisions. Great Decisions is a briefing book that the Foreign Policy Association publishes every January. It covers eight foreign policy topics and is the basis for a long running discussion program all over the United States and in many foreign countries. Deciding on the topics begins in the spring when we meet with an, our editorial advisory committee. The committee includes a variety of people, uh, including several academics, such as David Denoon from New York University and Michael Doyle from um, Columbia University. I also get input from many people who do the discussion program year after year. Uh, and they usually have very strong opinions on what topics they'd like to see covered uh, in the future. Usually we also break the topics into four that are geographic, uh, maybe covering one country or a region, and then four that are thematic covering something like trade policy, uh, defense policy, that sort of thing. The authors are usually experts in what they're writing about. Um, typically they're academics or uh, journalists. And each article includes background information, uh, historical information on the topic, then a look at the current situation, um, and then a look at what issues are, are looming, um, what policy options are available, and, and it leads to a good, dis a good discussion of what sorts of policy options, um, what the pros and cons are of various policy options. Um, the nice thing about the articles is that they allow people who are interested in foreign policy, but not necessarily expert to feel comfortable taking part in this kind of discussion. Um, the articles also include photos, uh, maps relevant to the material, um, suggested readings, uh, discussion questions, updates that we post uh, on the website, and also an opinion ballot, which we do every year. Uh, and that allows us to look back um, pretty long, 20, 30 years, and see how opinions have changed or not changed on certain uh, issues, which is really interesting. Anyway, I'd be happy to answer any questions in the uh, Q&A. Thank you. Hello. My name is Matthew Barbary. I work alongside Karen Rohan at the Foreign Policy Association on the Great Decisions uh, Briefing Book. And I'm also the uh, sort of the liaison between uh, the, the Great Decisions program and all of the different groups that we have, not only in the United States, but around the world. Uh, my favorite part about the, the Great Decisions program is its flexibility. And it's we, I've seen so many different kinds of groups since I've come to FBA. Uh, groups of, of, you know, just four or five neighbors who meet uh, once a week for eight weeks and, and uh, in, in they just split each other's living rooms and spend time there to large scale lectures of, of either held at universities or libraries or even online now, especially uh, of, of hundreds of people uh, from all over states and even across the country. Uh, the flexibility of the program, as I said, is probably its greatest strength. Uh, groups have sort of free reign to decide how they want to run their own programs. Uh, we have different guides for all these different kinds of groups uh, and offer suggestions, but mostly the most popular one I feel is the lead discussion model where either some uh, one member of the group uh, will take the lead or uh, groups will decide to bring an, ex an expert to speak, but um, usually it is uh, lecture based with one person, as I said, either 
one member of the group or an expert who, who is brought in, who speaks about the topic, uh, Q&A with the other members, and usually there's a discussion that follows it as well, uh, as, as well as uh, reading the materials and watching the DVD. Uh, the best part about that is uh, the, the program itself is meant to inspire people who maybe aren't the most knowledgeable in, in foreign policy to be able to have that kind of uh, knowledge and, and sort of the degree to speak in public about it. And uh, sort of the best part about that, as I said, is so it kind of leads into that led discussion aspect and how uh, most groups kind of tend to, to stick with that because uh, it gives uh, kind of the best sense of how, how different members are grasping the materials and also uh, sort of the major component is of course also the community building. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions about the program, uh, group, how to, how to design, how to organize a group, how to get your group started, uh, how to run different meetings, different meeting styles or anything of the like, I'll be more than happy to answer in the Q&A. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Matt. And thank you all for joining us. And thanks to the Fulbright Association for having us all here today. Uh, my name is McDara King, and I produce the Great Decisions TV series, which airs nationally on public television. Great Decisions is unique, not only because it's the largest discussion program on global affairs, but because it encourages people to push back on their own confirmation bias and step outside their echo chambers, uh, which we all build through social media and the traditional media we choose to consume. Uh, participants can test their thinking on these critical issues with members of their community who may not agree with them. And perhaps more importantly, they can hear the logic of others. Uh, an effective democracy requires informed citizens to guide policymakers. That's why we share the views of our Great Decisions participants with Congress through our National Opinion Ballot Report each year. Great Decisions Television is one of the longest running series uh, on the air, uh, alongside Meet the Press and Sesame Street. Uh, our production approach is unique. Most productions have an opinion and take you on a journey to reinforce that view. We instead identify the competing thinking on each issue, interview those experts, policymakers, journalists, and heads of state best positioned to explain the logic of each camp, uh, letting the viewer make their own great decision. I'd like to take uh, 10 minutes to share with you an excerpt from one of this season's films, which uh, looks at supply chains, and then we'll jump into the Q&A. Enjoy. Assembled in China. That's what it says on the box of the latest iPhone. But the full story is more complicated. Korean batteries. Japanese cameras. Taiwanese chips. German accelerometers. Congolese minerals all pieced together in China and sold around the world. The globalization of supply chains has made manufacturing more efficient and consumer goods cheaper. But what happens when a crisis hits? Great Decisions explores the interconnected web of the modern economy investigates the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on international trade, and asks whether the age of economic globalization might be coming to an end. Global supply chains and national security, next on Great Decisions.
The ferocious spread of COVID-19 in the spring of 2020 caught hospitals unprepared. By April, with supplies dwindling, doctors and nurses around the country were rationing gowns and reusing face masks. Our index case was March 1st. We knew by March 10th that we were gonna be in significant trouble. We did not anticipate uh, the profound disruption of the supply chain from China, where most of these masks came from. And as a consequence of that, we didn't just have a momentary disruption, we had a profound life-threatening disruption in our ability to procure supplies. Widespread shortages of medical equipment called popular attention to just how much the American medical system relies on international trade. Countries specialize in different types of equipment. Some of them export a lot of generic medicines like uh, India and China and protective equipment like masks or garments that help protect uh, the healthcare workers. Those are mostly produced in China and Malaysia. The pandemic has exacerbated long-standing concerns about how much the American economy relies on supply chains that passed through China. We're clearly going through a period where people feel very vulnerable. And given the trade tensions with China, um, the US is very sensitive about being reliant on China for any product or service at this point. There's a very good reason why people started buying things from China. That was, you could go there and order anything in large quantities and get it relatively quickly. And that will be very difficult and expensive to undo. Now, policymakers from both parties agree that the federal government must take action to secure critical supply chains. There is a strong need for us to have reliability in our supply chain so we can take care of our own citizens. Should there be other health emergencies like this. And sadly, we can predict with near certainty that there will be other health emergencies like this. Most nations that can will protect fundamental things like food supply, like medicine. Not every nation has that opportunity, but we do in the United States. The pandemic has also raised questions about how reliably Americans can access vital medicines in a time of crisis. The big concern is that some critical sort of key ingredients that go into certain patent medicines, uh, and those ingredients are sourced on a bulk basis within China. As a result of perhaps trade friction, there has been some restriction in terms of the availability of these feedstocks from Chinese factories and thus we're starting to see for certain types of medicines shortages at retail pharmacies. It's not just the manufacturing of the products themselves, but it's actually the containers in which these products will be shipped to us, the glass vials, the syringes, etc., for which demand has clearly already outstrip supply. It's also really hard to make these products de novo and in short order. But some experts warn that those who champion self-sufficiency should be mindful of the painful lessons learned by other countries that have tried to control their domestic food supplies. I'll give you an example. Argentina wanted to protect its beef and they didn't want their agricultural sector to be uh, exporting beef and making all this money while locals could not find beef. The Argentine beef business is smaller. They are not producing to full capacity. It is less profitable. Some people are going out of business. For economists and policymakers, 
the most concerning supply chains are those that feed high-tech manufacturing, a sector where countries around the world often rely on components produced in China. The more challenging issue and, and, and the more difficult issue is not PP or masks. Uh, it's sort of what to do with some of these, uh, you know, tech supply chains, other high-end goods, things like electric vehicles, lithium-ion batteries, semiconductors, those are the products that also have a pretty globalized supply chain. We've increasingly seen a convergence of commercial technologies and defense technologies and national security related technologies. We have huge vulnerabilities because of those dependencies on China. Many experts worry that China's control over the supply of key minerals could put the U.S. at a disadvantage. Exhibit A in that today would be rare earth materials, which are critical for pretty much every high technology application from you know, smartphones to electric cars to military applications of all sorts. China is the source of 80 plus percent of the rare earth production in the world, not because rare earths are actually all that rare, but because the mining of them is very dirty and environmentally damaging and the Chinese have been more willing to do this than other countries. In 2010, they basically cut off our supplies of rare earths. That's a vulnerability that we have to address. These are the sorts of determinations that we have to make, partly at a political level, level partly at an economic level to determine how much we need to return to the United States. As trade tensions with China grow, experts debate to what extent concerns about China can be mitigated by diversifying supply chains to other countries. China is no longer the lowest wage economy in the world, and so people have been moving factories out of China and into Vietnam, Bangladesh, the Philippines, Mexico. And so there has been a natural diversification as people move away from China. I think that's healthy. You can expect to see a diversification of supply chains moving forward. But one thing I will say about China is that there are many companies that are still engaged in China and indeed even increasing their investments in Chinese manufacturing. But it's primarily because of the growth of the domestic Chinese consumer. You may not be able to have your full supply chain in your country, but if you're going to have it in another country, you want it to be one where there is geographic proximity. So in our case, we'll probably have more supply chains closer in Mexico or in Canada when they can't be in the U.S. The best answer is to diversify, is to have a supply chain that is all over the world so that companies and governments don't depend on input that comes from one country or from one region. In a broader sense, the COVID-19 pandemic has magnified long-standing frustrations with an economy built on global trade. What was happening before coronavirus was this move toward protectionism, uh, move toward uh, self-reliance, the tariff war, the trade war. And then on top of that came COVID. So that just added to the problems. Free trade was in trouble before COVID. Um, many, many Americans and many people around the world are beginning, were beginning to question the merits of free trade and whether free trade has indeed provided economic benefits to all members of its societies. But there is no doubt that COVID has accelerated concerns about free trade at a time when the benefits and drawbacks of trade have become a contentious part of the national political debate, some observers now wonder whether the era of free trade is over. There's no question that the benefits of globalization are under fundamental attack. 
from the perspective here in the United States, we were winners for a long time. Uh, the last 30 years or so, relatively speaking, we've been the losers. Other countries are gaining more from trade than we are. I think what we're seeing is a partial turning inward, perhaps a correction from maybe a period in which we were over globalized, somewhat too dependent on imports in a variety of different places. Obviously, there's been a disillusionment with the most extreme manifestations of, of free trade, but I don't think that the American public is buying this. 95% of the world's consumers live outside the United States. If we're becoming more and more efficient in manufacturing goods with fewer workers, the only way we can expand jobs is to open markets around the world. say it's a matter of time a thousand days and the sun won't shine before i come back to you analysts are eager to draw attention to the work behind the scenes that despite the upheavals and uncertainties of the pandemic has kept hospitals supplied and supermarkets stocked the U.S. supply chain for pharmaceutical-based products is unparalleled in the world. It is really the gold standard. Although the pandemic has stressed our system, it has remarkably held up very, very well to these stresses. I will say that the private sector has done uh, quite an amazing job to be able to get the supplies that we have today. And if you go to a grocery store, you'll, you'll see some out of stocks, but it is quite an accomplishment that you see the number of products that are there. And in order for those products to get there, there had to have been a tremendous amount of work and rework on a supply chain. Around the world, Consumers have become accustomed to the advantages of an economic system that has become astonishingly efficient. Cheaper goods, bigger selections, and faster delivery. But economic interdependence brings new risks. The hard-learned lessons of the COVID pandemic will loom large in the years to come as policymakers, economists, and business leaders work to prepare for the next great crisis. Nothing's going to stop. I'm making my way home, I'm making my way. I go so low, oh, I go so low. I'm making my way home, I'm making my way. All right, thank you so much for that. Um, does anyone have any questions? It looks like a few, a few of you have asked questions in the chat, and I think they've been answered by uh, members of the Foreign Policy Association. But feel free to use the raise hand feature, add things to the chat uh, while we have some, some FPA people here to answer. And uh, briefly, Matt, we had a question in the chat uh, that maybe you can address. Um, uh, we had someone asking about how a chapter would interact with GD. Do you want to explain a little bit about how the structure of the Great Decisions Program, the eight meetings, uh, and, and how it all works? Sure, absolutely. Um, so hi, uh, I'm Matt again from the video. Uh, still getting over how my voice sounds. Uh, but yeah, so the program, uh, the eight topics, we basically the interaction would be uh, you would have, uh, you would decide how would you, you would divide. We don't kind of hold uh, groups to like, you have to do the topics in the order that we present them because uh, different groups have, uh, you know, if they're, uh, have a certain speaker for certain days, they can only get them for, uh, you know, a certain talk here or there. Uh, we have the eight topics um, uh, corresponding with the eight uh, TV episodes. Um, and how you would sort of interact with them is we suggest mostly uh, before meetings, you would have 
uh, distributed the materials, um, we usually say uh, a book for each participant and then one either DVD or streaming service for the entire group uh, for the videos. Um, groups, uh, members would usually read uh, the associated uh, topic before the meeting. Uh, we do have some groups that meet uh, and read them together, but that, that can just take time. And uh, most groups tend to want to not uh, stay for longer than an hour or so, but uh, you have, you would have the eight topics. Um, and then, so yeah, everyone would read and then usually groups would watch the episodes together. Uh, either, uh, obviously now groups are streaming uh, using uh, Zoom. So they would screen share, but, but in the past we would have groups that would just, you know, watch, they would walk, go in and the first thing they would do is watch the episode together. Um, and then uh, Q&A, uh, different groups ha have uh, different structures to how they wanna actually go about their discussion meetings, whether they want it to be lecture-based, whether they want it to be uh, just a series of questions among participants and trying to find the answers together. And then ultimately uh, the goal is that everyone puts their uh, opinions together uh, and they respond to our opinion ballot, uh, which is in the back of each book and is also online. Um, the opinion ballot is kind of the biggest uh, resource for um, sort of the, the bridge between FPA and all the different great decisions groups. We get feedback on a, the opinions of everyone on the different topics, and then also uh, how people are interested, how interested they are in certain topics, um, how much they want to uh, sort of continue to have a see, see us uh, make more uh, topics and maybe in that certain area or within that certain um, topic. Uh, and then we, we pass that on to uh, members, members of Congress, uh, uh, executive branch, uh, uh, like, you know, the Department of State, Department of uh, Defense, uh, and as well as um, uh, state officials as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, this is a really great toolkit um, for chapters to use. Uh, it's very structured. It's a nice program um, that I think a lot of Fulbrighters would really be interested in. So thank you. Um, Albert, did you have something you'd like to say? Oh, I believe you're on mute. I always think of the Great Decisions Program as sort of like a reading group where you don't have a four inch book to read. You have 10 really concise pages and lots of pictures and maps. And then you have these great films so that you have a combination of media that are very accessible, but uh, very well informed and, and neutral in terms of political stance. If, if they give one stand, they give the other stand. So it's, I shouldn't say neutral, I should say balanced. Um, and then uh, it allows you to talk with your friends uh, and f fellow Fulbrighters about a current topic with enough information so you can say, oh yes, but you know, then these uh, are not the cri you know, critical ingredients, uh, doesn't mean that they're hard to find. It just means that no one wants to mine them so that they become rare. Um, and you say, oh, okay, so that's a different point of the politics. And it's such um, a pleasure to have a whole pile of facts that you can easily access. And you can bring in people who are like any reading group who read deeply into material or people who just have a less depth of, of uh, reading maybe but equal inspirations about what it means you know a lot of a lot of um, points of view come not from digging deep but from looking wide and uh, the great decision program allows you to do all of those things simultaneously and so it sounds very complicated but it's actually really simple because it's just a book and some films and your friends. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, Go ahead, Matt. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, that's uh, all excellent points. And uh, yeah, kind of going back to what uh, our uh, TV producer, Max, said during his, his video, uh, we try and always remain balanced and present, the, uh, present any topic in a way that 
you know, you're not going to immediately read it and say, oh, well, you know, these guys got a slant. They're, they're you know, they're working for the government, you know, something like that. And it, we always try and, and give face value to all sides. And that kind of allows, again, for sort of the wider net of people. Uh, as as uh, Elber mentioned kind of uh, before, we try and, you know, incorporate as many people in communities, getting them together. And this sort of fostering of democracy has to happen via these kind of these kind of discussions where we get together, we we expose the different points, we sort of listen to the other side as well, and we kind of hopefully come to a uh, concise conclusion amongst each other, or at least uh, a better understanding of uh, each other, which I think is also uh, starting to be kind of sorely lacking. This seems to be much more of a uh, uh, you put up you put up a divide, and it, sh it should never move. Yeah, and that definitely aligns with the Fulbright mission, um, Leslie. I see that you have your hand raised. Hi, oh, everyone. Was... Matt, did you want to say something? And I, I'm sorry, Matthew, I should not have shortened your name. Did you want to say something? Matt, Matt is perfectly fine. I was just saying, I, I did see your question. I'm going to um, send you a direct message with my work email, and I'm going to get back to you with some of those examples, if that was what your question was going to be. Uh, that's great. No, I appreciate that. I have a second question. Oh, and absolutely. So my, yeah, thank you very much. My second question is really more a matter of clarification, and it's about the opinion ballot that you mentioned. So I'm wondering, is the opinion ballot about, you know, the individual participants opinion on the foreign policy issue itself, or is it more user feedback on the materials? And if it's opinion about the foreign policy issue, when that is sent to Congress and all of those other um, agencies that were mentioned, how, how is that feedback sent on? So we have a, like a light section in the beginning in demographics. Uh, and each time we, we kind of do take like a poll, like how interested were you in this topic? Um, uh, you, and, and you know, you have the very interested, somewhat interested, not that interested, not at all interested. Um, and that's purely kind of almost for us. We put it in the report. Uh, but that's sort of so we can kind of get a pulse of what our, our viewership, our programming, uh, our members want. Uh, and then from there, all of the actual questions uh, pertaining to the individual topics. So like outside of, uh, I think like there's, you know, how did you, how much of the materials have you uh, been exposed to? Like, did you just read the book? Did you just watch an episode? Did you just see an episode on PBS? Uh, have you been part of a discussion group? Do you take a class? Uh, are you an expert? Do you consider yourself an expert in the field? And, and sort of some like, you know, one or two or three questions to start. And then it would be about six to nine questions directly about the policy. Like, how did, did you feel you know, the Trump administration made it the correct move in pulling out of the Paris Accord? Uh, yes, uh, very much so. Not so much. Not at all. Uh, uh, yeah, so exactly. And, and so all of those questions are kind of, and then it's put together. Um, we have both a physical uh, a sort of pamphlet that we print out and then a PDF and we send both. Um, we, we usually try and get emails for, uh, uh, we, obviously it's pretty easy to get all the emails, but you get sort of the, the work emails for all of uh, members of Congress and, and people within the dep different departments, as well as mailing them physical, uh, physical copies. And what it is, it is presented as we are the largest um, Nonprofit, uh, nonpartisan, uh, foreign policy, uh, uh, large scale discussion program in the United States, the largest. Our opinion, uh, our, each of our members are given eight of topics. Here are the eight topics. Uh, and here are their opinions on each of the different issues and what they hope to see from uh, either legislature or the executive branch as well. And uh, it's presented as a way of saying this is the opinion of not only your constituents potentially, but also the, the general American public that we have we've gathered. If interested people who have taken the step to try and not only gain more knowledge within the, in the, the, the different topics, but also are politically motivated as well to, to want to see some kind of um, uh, outcome or conclusion to uh, some of the topics. Obviously not all of them are going to have a very, uh, cut and dry, hey, just please do this and then we'll see how it goes. Uh, but in certain cases, like uh, going back to climate change, 
basically saying our viewership is, uh, I mean, not our viewership, but our, uh, our different discussion members are adamant that uh, we return to the Paris Court or something like that, something to that effect. Great. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Oh, let's see. Um, um, okay, so the, the point of this is um, we're hoping to get some toolkits from the Foreign Policy Association to distribute to our chapters so that you can hold these great decision um, discussions with your members. Um, so if you are, I put this in the chat, but if you are interested in getting a toolkit for your chapter, please email me at chapters at Fulbright.org and we'll get back to you. And uh, Christine, I, I just saw a, another question in the chat uh, related to um, <clears throat> whether Fulbright chapters would become members of FPA. Uh, they, they wouldn't need to. This is uh, a grassroots program. Uh, you know, many of the Great Decisions discussion groups across the country um, are not registered with us at all. We don't really know uh, how many there actually are at the end of the day because it's, it's designed to be very much a light touch program, uh, you know, you don't really need any interaction with uh, FPA to participate. Yeah, and then kind of going back, my eternal struggle is getting groups to uh, register uh, uh, just because it, it's very handy for um, potential new members. We have people going on our website all the time and being like, is there a group here? And I'm like, uh, yes, but here's their information. It's on a it's on a different site, or I'll end up making the page for myself. Um, but yeah, uh, we have. Um, it is kind of very touch and go. It, it's meant to be kind of uh, however you want it to be, it's flexible and and kind of what go back. What I said is like uh, getting you can get uh, large scale groups, and they're always usually made of. Uh, interested people, but then you'll always get some people who are like, oh, I just like going to, going to listen, <laughs> listen to a lecture and talk with some of my friends about something. Community involvement, that's also a, a kind of a big factor too. Great. Well, is there anything else you all would like to add? Madara, Matt, Karen? No, I think this is, uh, I, I'm just, uh, I'm thankful for the chance to, to speak with you guys. I'm always, uh, I sent my, my email to uh, Leslie, but um, I will, uh, I have my information on, on the, the website. Uh, it's just my, my first initial and my last name at fpa.org. If you have any other questions, um, I, I'm, it's my job to help and I like doing it because I like to see this program uh, I would like to see this program in more places because I think now, uh, now more than ever, we kind of need uh, a, 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 a program like this that uh, not only can educate people, but also bring them together. And I would just add that um, if you want to find out more about the Great Decisions program, you can uh, look at the Great Decisions section of our website, fpa.org. It has uh, guides for setting up different types of programs. Uh, depending upon uh, you know the, the structure of the organization, and it's got some some of the history of the of the uh, discussion program on there, and some some history about uh, FPA. Uh, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at info at fpa.org as well. Thank you so much for joining us today and giving us this presentation. I think this was a really exciting opportunity for our chapters to participate. Um, if anyone has questions, like I said, please send me an email at chapters at Fulbright.org. I can put you in touch with the FPA team and um, I can help you get a toolkit. So thank you so much for joining everyone. I hope you have a nice night. Thanks so much for having us. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, everyone.